white background, text Chafee College, with logo of two hills, text Wignall Museum of Contemporary Art, home edition, text is enclosed in image of house, artist talk, Isabella Vila, June 23rd, 2021 from 12.30 to 1.30 p.m. PDT. Hi everyone, welcome, thank you for joining us at today's program featuring LA-based artist Isabel Avila, presented as part of the Wignall Museum's home edition a series of curated artist talks, workshops, and discussions featuring artists and cultural workers. Screen is split into four boxes. Top left is person with short hair and large glasses. Top right is person with mustache and glasses with text Chafee College in top right of their box and letters C-U-C-A-O-N-G are visible in the background. Bottom right is person with long blonde hair with text Chafee College in top right of their box and letters C-U-C-O-N-G are visible in the background. Bottom left is person with glasses and long dark curly hair. Screen switches to only bottom right box with text Rebecca Trawick. My name is Rebecca Trawick. I'm the director and curator of the Wignall Museum. House logo with original enclosed text top left. Text, Wignall Museum of Contemporary Art. The Wignall Museum of Contemporary Art is a teaching museum and interdisciplinary art space that introduces Chafee College students, faculty, and staff and community members to innovative contemporary art objects and ideas. By fostering critical thinking, visual literacy, discourse, and empathy, the museum seeks to enhance the intellectual and cultural life of our community. The Wigdell Museum is a teaching museum and interdisciplinary art space that introduces Chafee College students, faculty, staff, and community members to innovative contemporary art objects and ideas. By fostering critical thinking, visual literacy, discourse, and empathy, the museum seeks to enhance the intellectual and cultural life of our community. To learn more about Native Land Acknowledgement, Please visit https colon slash slash usdac.us slash native land https colon slash slash native dash land ca. We want to take a moment to recognize that we are situated on the Ranch of Cucamonga campus of Chafee College, which resides on the traditional and unceded lands of the Tongva people. We offer our recognition and respect to the elders, both past, present, and future. View of top left box, text, Roman Stallenwork. And hello, my name is Roman Stallenwork. I'm assistant curator at the Wignall Museum. We are recording all sessions of Home Edition. When possible, recordings are made available on our website. All recordings on our site include captions and audio descriptions as options. House logo top left, text, Wignall Museum of Contemporary Art. Access our schedule of programs and recordings www.chafee.edu slash Wignall. Visit us at www.chafee.edu slash Wignall to access our full schedule of programs and available recordings. Visit our website About Us page if you would like to sign up to receive email announcements. You can follow us on social media, including Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Wignall Museum. Text, receive announcements about our programs. Subscribe to our email list www.chafee.edu slash wignall slash about dash us dot php. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, at Wignall Museum. We ask that you complete a quick online survey that will help us as we evaluate our online programming and plan our future programs. HTTPS colon slash slash tinyurl.com slash Wignall Spring 21 Visitor Survey. After today's session, we ask that you complete a brief survey at tinyurl.com slash Wignall Spring 21 Visitor Survey. Thank you. View of top right box. Text Andrew Hadel. Hi everyone, my name is Andy Hadel. I'm the preparator at the museum, along with Rebecca and Roman. I'll be assisting in today's Zoom session. In a moment, Isabel will present for about a half an hour, with the remaining time being available for a Q&A. Four box view. Thanks, Roman and Andy. Um, today, I'm pleased to introduce our guest artist, Isabel Avila. Bottom right box view. Isabel Avila is a Los Angeles-based artist who primarily uses color film photography to doc document aspects of cultural history. Isabel is dedicated to exploring local histories of Southern California, focusing on presenting a subjective perspective of the overlap in local native and Chicano culture. Avila's photographs show the history living, working and actively creating a counter narrative to mainstream perception. Avila received her MFA in photography at Cal State University Long Beach and her BFA in photography and imaging at Art Center College of Design. Avila's work has been shown at institutions such as the Vincent Price Art Museum, our own Wignall Museum, the University of Dayton, and LACMA's Charles White Gallery. Work from her Native America series joined the collection at the Gene Autry Museum of Western Heritage, 
Avila has completed a series of eight portraits of Native Americans for the permanent permanent exhibit, Becoming LA, at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles. So please join me in welcoming Isabel and give her a warm virtual welcome. Isabel, welcome and take it away. Bottom left box view, text Isabel Avila. I just want to say thank you to everyone for being here and thanks for having me. White screen, text, Isabel Avila, um, photo-based artist working in Tongva territory slash Los Angeles. Putting the pieces together colon personal history family history, history of land, indigenous, political slash colonial history, evolution of cultural history and identity, race and effects of discrimination. Basically, I'm a photo-based artist working in Tongva territory, also known as Los Angeles. And when I'm making my work, I am exploring pretty much personal identity, family history, history of land, indigenous political colonial history, evolution of cultural history and identity, race and effects of discrimination. And this is sort of my exploration of putting um, the pieces together of my own family history. Black and white photo on left of woman in short sleeve floral shirt and shoulder length dark curly hair leaning on a column smiling to camera. Black and white photo on right of woman with light white short hair sitting wearing fluffy white one shouldered gown black background, light hitting her face. So I think um, things sort of start with my questions to my grandmother, who's now deceased. And these are both pictures of her. And the one in the left um, is a portrait she took when she was 18, I believe. And she signed it. Um, she signed it Bretta Martinez. And that's uh, basically, well, let me rewind a little bit. So I would ask my, my grandmother basically like about uh, family heritage and a lot of what was passed down was a lot of um, like Spanish ancestry as to like what part of Spain my family is from and things of that nature. But a lot of the um, native ancestry was sort of uh, hidden or kept or something that was kind of like to be ashamed of and something that wasn't really, that was intentionally not passed down. So I, it started to like get me more interested in knowing about that aspect of my ancestry. So, and if I can bring attention to that, her signature again on this photograph, um, her name is Dolores, but uh, she signed it Preta, and that's sort of like a, a derogatory term um, that is used to describe like darker skinned girls or so and I really by looking at the signature and it looks like she like wrote over it like maybe she wrote Dolores on it and then wrote over it you know Preta, and it just it it made me it was sort of loaded that like you know this term that was given to her was something that she probably didn't really um, want and this sort of like active awareness of um, you know your skin color and sort of like a caste system so and then the picture on the on the right is also of her that I took much later in undergrad but I just I just threw it in there as a sort of contrast of like you know, what it, what it would be like um, photographing her in a sort of like a classical <laughs> sort of setting, which was something that um, I thought it would be interesting to sort of do. So I, I took that. And these pictures will come in later, which I'll show you. When you get it. Black and white photo on left, man in dark pants and light jacket and hat standing next to fence holding a piece of paper looking to camera. Black and white photo on right, 38 children. Boys in suit and ties and girls in veils, and three adults in black white garb stand in four rows and look to camera. The image on the left is of my great grandfather. This is my grandmother's father, who was, uh, uh, you know, like of native descent, and her mother was um, very Spanish, so like light skin, blue eyed, pretty fair head, fair haired, and everything. And she ended up marrying this. Um, man that she met working on the railroads. They were working on the railroads out here in California. 
And basically, um, my grandmother's mother was widowed. They were like Spanish ranchers and the husband got murdered for like ranch. And, and so she was widowed with uh, quite a few children. So she married this man that I guess you can say was sort of like below her caste or whatever. And um, she had more children with, with him. And, and the product of that second marriage was my grandmother. And so thinking about this like environment that my grandmother grew up in that was a family environment that actually um, was, there was internalized prejudice in that, in that family. And so there's a lot of these issues I think that exist in Latino culture that um, people don't deal with or haven't dealt with. And then the image on the right um, is, is another family image, it's my aunt, but I'm using this as an example as, as all of our family members have gone through this Catholic uh, religious sort of ceremony <laughs> of, um, of uh, Catholicism, uh, of First Communion. And it's a, it's a reflection of um, the church's role in society as uh, contributing to some erasure, some level of erasure, which um, I'll get to later. Black and white image of a tree trunk with a stretched out picture of photo of woman in floral shirt leaning on column from before lying on top of it at an angle. Text beside image, grandma 20 by 20 archival image 2017. So in this, in this photograph I took, um, I got that old photograph of my grandmother that I showed you guys and I stretched it out and I've always been a fan of that um, classic uh, painting, the uh, Holbein painting, the ambassadors, which has the skull that's stretched out, the anamorphic skull. And I, I love, I love that painting. <laughs> but so I um, got that photograph of my grandmother and I stretched it out in this way where um, it obscures her identity, obscures like who she is. And it sort of embodies the feeling of me trying to sort of like ex explore or know um, some aspects to this family history. But just like the Holby painting, this anamorphic space here can be viewed, it can be viewed from an angle and then you can actually see the distortion will, uh, it will um, shrink in space and you, you can actually see the image if you see it from like an angle, certain, a certain angle. Black and white image of naked woman sitting in chair facing away from camera with right leg extended long and bowing over the back of the chair toward pictures of the man standing next to fence and woman seated in gown from before. Text beside photo, genetic memory 5x7 archival link jet 2018. And then I used a couple of these other images that I just showed you in another, this is sort of like an exploration of sort of, um, you know, exploring and just thinking about um, family issues and history and past and how these things, they carry a lot of weight and they, they carry a lot of weight on the individual as the product of these things and how there's like historical trauma and family trauma, things that get passed down and just thinking about, you know, ways, how do people deal with these things or how do, how do you navigate through these issues um, that are, very personal and also very like social and broad. So um, this is sort of like a representation of that. Five images, first from left, building facade with front facing windows and two flags waving, flag on left is American. Second from left, one story building with sign Sarah, third from left, one story building with blurry writing. Fourth from left, brick columns with a sign of blurry letters. Fifth from left, an intersection and palm tree with blurry street sign. Text beside images, canonization of Sarah 10 by 43 archival inkjet 2018. So um, thinking about these like issues of internalized family racism and, and um, you know, social class structures and castes and 
things <laughs> thinking about the time also that like my ancestors or people living in this area at the time like what they experienced as like new new waves of influence political social cultural influences started to come into the Los Angeles area and and um thinking about like um the history like the current his living history and sort of um where these things come from so I started to look at uh Junipero Serra who was the man he was the friar who was basically he was an agent of the Spanish Inquisition that basically came out to um, he came out to America to um, develop the mission system. And he developed the, the mission system and um, he's so ingrained in the history of California that it's impossible to like, he's just everywhere. Like he's in, in the, so many different things are named after him. And I basically took some photographs of buildings and schools and libraries and streets and different things that were named, are named after him. There's memorials essentially. So this, are, this is a, a little bit of that. Um, Close up of first image from left, facade a building with American flag on left and other flag on right of entrance. Above entrance text, Junipero Serra building. Text beside image, Junipero Serra state office building DTLA 10 by 10 archival link jet 2018. This is just a close up of the Junipero Serra building. So you can kind of see that the name right there. Image of four books laying on cement surface. Top book is upside down and has image of man on front with text father who Nipero Sarah. Text beside image, Sarah on Sarah, 40 by 40 archival link jet 2018. And then these are um, books that I checked out from the Nipero Sarah library on Nipero Sarah. And that was really interesting because um, they had a lot of um, they, had, they had a lot of children's books that that were there you know, teaching children who he is and what he stood for and how important he is to California history and sort of um, failed to kind of give a bigger picture of the complexity of the situation because this history is very complex and his um, role is very controversial and basically um, how, you know, the Native community is, is greatly impacted in a negative way based on what he did, though there's a lot of conflict of ideas where it's compared to other situations, maybe on the East Coast, where Natives didn't have any rights, at least he, he gave some rights and didn't kill everybody, or, you know, but he openly was for uh, torturous punishment and basically enslaved, enslavement of Native people, but that was still a notch above treatment of them elsewhere. So that, so putting the pieces together of um, history and treatment of brown people, I guess you could say. Um, okay, and this is an image of um, one of those California mission projects, those school mission projects that every like fourth grader was supposed to make. I remember making one. And I took this picture up the street from me. Image of 3D model of cathedral on the ground next to a curb near a TV and tipped paper cup also on ground. Text beside image, discarded mission project 30 by 30 archival inkjet, Pasadena, California, 2017. And it was just a discarded piece. And I just thought how like kind of symbolic. <laughs> How symbolic it, it was in, in a sense. But I think today, I think that there's a little more awareness and a little more education. I don't really know exactly how they're, how 
I, I think there's some change as to how they're presenting that California history to students these days. But um, up to like maybe like a year or two ago, I still went to a school and I photographed a lot of these mission projects. And I, I still have like these other images of these uh, missions. And so, I mean, I find it fascinating, but the mission is used as it's rom it was romanticized and it was used um, to bring people, the re-envisioning of the mission, how it was romanticized was used during like the real estate boom and the economic boom in California to bring people to California. So, you know, the missions were dilapidated and then it got this like makeover as this romantic era so that, um, you know, investors can come out to California. So, it's not exactly, I mean, it's, there's a more to it than that. <laughs> Anyhow. Three images. Left, rectangular photo of a woman with long curly hair wearing a blanket wrapped around shoulders with hands on lap. She wears turquoise ring on right hand. Middle image, smaller square photo of smoke rising from a dish in lower left corner. Right image, rectangular photo of woman wearing two long braids, fitted cap, yellow shirt, and straw skirt. Text below images, Life Cycle Gloria Arianes and Mitzla Aguilera, archival link jet various sizes 2019. These are two descendants of the, of the San Gabriel mission. They're both Tongva, these two ladies, uh, Gloria Arianes and Mitzla Aguilera. So, you know, I always see my practice as sort of like digging deeper, like what leads to what um, and and um, so, yeah, these two women are, are Tongva representatives, very active in the community. And Gloria Ariana is on the left. She, uh, I met her when I was doing my Vincent Price project, and I was looking for someone that sort of like overlapped a uh, native community and. Um, Chicano community, and that was active in both. And she really embodied that. She's very active in both communities. She's a, an elder in the community now and is uh, doing a lot of work. Um, and so the, I'll go back to her. She, she, you know, she took me into her life really, and she calls me daughter, and I, you know, have a very close relationship with her. And um, we go to a lot of events together. We're pretty close, and it's a good thing. Oh, and I did want to add, I did take these pictures at um, the CSULB powwow, and I try to photograph there at every powwow, and um, I have others, other, other images as well. Another inspiration is, um, well, was, the La Raza exhibit at the Gene Autry Museum and looking at that magazine, that, that political newspaper that existed out of um, the Church of the Epiphany and the kind of work that they were doing. And that exhibit, I don't know if anyone got a chance to see it, but it was a really great exhibit. It, well, for, for photo lovers <laughs> and political movement lovers and stuff. But it was a it was a great exhibit. I had like over three hundred photographs and and um, a lot of historical stuff. Photo of a piece of paper with an image of a Native American man in profile, wrapped in upside down American flag and full body, holding a gun with text La Raza Volume One Number Eleven Seventy Five Cents News and Political Thought of the Chicano Struggle. Quote Wounded Knee and Quote Text beside photo La Raza Exhibition Gene Autry Museum of the West. La Rasa paper played a seminal role in the Chicano movement. And what I was looking at were things like um, how uh, these like uh, interdisciplinary or no, uh, cross-cultural struggle, struggles, sort of like how the Ch Chicano community was, was basically supporting Wounded Knee and and also a lot of the Black Panther situation. So there's a lot of uh, intersectionality that was happening back then. And here on the cover of La Raza magazine is uh, Russell Means and the issue 
a wounded knee that was happening in the early 70s. And they were showing their support of that struggle. It's, I guess it's a colonial struggle, I guess you can say. So it, it's, it's, and it's, uh, it's all related. Um, and also, yeah, the, the magazines played a big role in the Chicano movement. Three images. Left, two photos in frames. Top photo is women all wearing dark pants and light tunic in symmetrical formation in front of one story building. Bottom photo. Three men and one child in ascending hide from left to right wearing brown berets. Top right image, black and white image of women with long dark hair seated and clapping. One woman wears sunglasses bottom right image, a woman with long dark hair, men with suspenders and cap, and men with long dark hair and headband look to camera. Text under images, La Rosa magazine exhibit at the Jean Autry Museum of American West. So these are images um, from that exhibit, from the magazine, and... The woman with the sunglasses on the top right uh, is Gloria, the woman that I photographed. Um, and these, the, there are various pictures of like from different political rallies um, and such. And then on the top left, and it looks like the bottom left as well, there are um, brown berets. And I'm really fascinated with just the, the whole concept of like uh brown berets because it's it's it does fascinate because it's like this it's taken after like a militaristic thing but yet yeah i i go into that later but anyway <laughs> at the bottom left is um you know black and brown solidarity so all these issues that i'm interested in i was able to see were document documented or issues you know in the late 60s early 70s and I'm just curious how these things sort of evolve. And here's a Rosalia Munoz, and the picture on the left is him, a documentation of him at that exhibit, um, the La Rosa exhibit. And then images of him on the, on, the, on the right are images that I took at one of these events. Two images. Left, framed black and white photo of man in khaki pants and dark jacket standing in front of desk with one finger of right hand raised. Right. Three colored photos of older man in red shirt and light rimmed hat speaking in front of microphone gesticulating. Text under images, Rosalio Munoz Chicano activist and organizer then and now. So one of these co commemorative events. And basically why I'm showing this is to sort of illustrate that my involvement um, extends to me seeking out and attending these events and looking for the act the veteran activists and speaking with them and looking at how things evolved over time and um becoming friends with these people so this is a portrait that i took of um Dr. David Sanchez. Image of man in dark green military dress and brown beret standing in front of building draped with banner with text for rent 626-482-9490, holding a plaque that reads, Ruben Salazar and blurry dates. Text beside image, Dr. David Sanchez, activist, founding member of Brown Berets, site of shooting of Ruben Salazar, East Los Angeles 2020. He's um, an activist, founding member of the Brown Berets and um, really was instrumental in the walkouts. There were a few people that organized and were part of the walkouts. So um, I wanted to do a portrait of him just and to have that. So I have this one and this, this image of him, he's holding a Ruben Salazar plate and that Ruben Salazar, I don't know if anyone knows, but he was a Mexican-American activist and news reporter. He worked for the LA Times and he was covering the Chicano moratorium of, of 1970, I believe, August 29th. And he was shot and killed by a sheriff, LA sheriff deputy. And that was a really controversial thing that happened. A lot of people believed he was targeted because he, his reporting started to lean a little more to the left, things like that. So 
and he was becoming more of a prominent re reporter. He was working for more mainstream media, things like that. So a lot of people feel he was targeted. Um, so he was shot and killed at one of these events in like a bar and it was documented as well. So um, actually reporters of the La Raza magazine, well, the editor documented it. So anyhow, this is at the site location of that shooting. And, and I'm happy to have this image with David holding that plaque, which um, David, he comes every year to the space to remember what happened there. And there, he had that plaque and he put it up himself on the back of that wall, if you can see, but it never stays there. So I guess it falls up. It was sort of his own thing. I think he's trying to officialize it through the city and all that stuff. Image of woman with long dark hair, white tank top, suspenders, and dark gray pants wearing a red and white fitted cap and tattoo on upper left arm stands with hands in pockets on an angle to camera looking left against a color blocked mustard and fuchsia colored background. Text beside image, Chicano style commemorative Chicano moratorium event, Salazar Park. East Los Angeles 2020. So um, as I was talking about my involvement, so I try to go every year to um, to the commemorative moratorium events and document a few things or take some portraits of people to sort of show who's been there and what's this sort of like identity, you know, Chicano identity or native identity, you know, what does it mean? So um, this is another portrait that I took of um, this woman at the moratorium event at Salazar Park, which was named after Ruben Salazar, it used to be called Laguna Park. Or something. Two images. Left, a man with gray mustache, white shirt, green jacket, and brown beret holds up right fist standing in front of dark green curtain. Right, man with brown mustache, glasses, and hat wearing plaid shirt standing in front of dark green curtain. Text under images, veterans of the Chicano movement Caesar and Cruz Alameda, archival link at 30 by 30 each, East Los Angeles 2018. These are uh, more pictures of uh, veterans of the Chicano movement, uh, Caesar and Cruz Alameda. Cruz was also a significant um, individual who's participated in the walkouts. There were quite a few different organizers who um, participated in organizing walkouts. So he was another individual. But these photographs were taken at one of the commemorative events. So I, you know, I attend the events and then I take my camera and I photograph them there. So it's not like I'm doing this in a studio or anything. It's all like in the, in the space. So image of photo of man with long, gray, low ponytail holding leaves to his nose standing in front of low green and brown brush in the desert. The right bottom corner of photo has a white splotch. Text Shannon Rivers Gathering. Creosote Spirit Intervention. Arizona, Tohono Atum, Archival Inkjet 2015. So kind of, um, you know, looking in Chicano community and then I all, you know, I, I tend to like to look a little deeper as to like, you know, I, I guess you can say I identify as a Chicana, but I feel that my native ancestry is still a blur. It's still like not quite, you know, defined. I kind of have this idea, you know, that, you know, where some of it is from and, you know, but there's a, there's still much to be discovered in that area and the sort of Chicano um, title sort of encompasses that you recognize native ancestry, but it's never like, it's not very specific enough. So. I tend to look into native culture to be a little more specific as when it comes to like traditional values and outlook in life and, and perspectives of like just understanding the world. Cause you know, Chicano culture is very much in, involved in like this political sphere, you know, and a, a lot of um, current political things really influence identity and things like that. Anyhow, so this image is of uh, Shannon Rivers and he's of the Tohono O'odham Nation. And this is when I was visiting Arizona and um, he was gathering some creosote medicine 
it's a great medicine. It works great for skin <laughs> issues and other things. And um, he gave me permission, or he act he actually mentioned that if I can take some images of him. And so I had full permission to photograph him as he was gathering, gathering medicine. But um, you know that can also be a, like a prayerful, a prayerful act. So it, interestingly enough, that um, as I was taking these pictures, my camera started to jam, and it was like not it was malfunctioning. <laughs> so then I got I was I was well with the belief is that you know maybe I wasn't supposed to take that picture or maybe it was like you know it was something that was, you know you're supposed to be there and you're not supposed to photograph so anyhow so this image got light leaks and the camera jammed and I had told him about it and he was just like oh wait well, you know I guess spirit of the medicine is very was really strong that day so and I guess it was but you know, this is like the power of, you know, of, I, I, I'm leaving it up to your own to decide if that is true or not, but it's something that, you know, happened to me. And I think it happened well, like maybe like one at a time. <laughs> Anyhow, so, so yeah, I, I, I do call this a spirit intervention because um, of that incident. Image of paper photo of blue waves laying in an awkward position with most of it on the ground and some of it bent up a wall of a hallway with green linoleum floor and steps going up in bottom of image. Text beside image, knowing water, CSU Long Beach slash Pavongna. 40 by 40 color photograph, archival link jet 2019. And this is a different series, so I'm, I'm bringing this a little more back from Arizona, but this is Long Beach. This is uh, Cal State University Long Beach, uh, also known as Pavangna. And for those that don't know, the school, Cal State Long Beach, is situated on a Tongva Hashiman um, gathering space, a village space, a burial ground, a very important um, ceremonial space. So I was, um, I, you know, I went to grad school there and I was just thinking like, do people walking around have any idea like where they're walking on and the history of, of the place that they're walking on? Do they have any insight as to this kind of other world of consciousness that exists um, on the space? So it made me think of like portals or interventions or things that we could kind of shift our consciousness in the space. So I, none of these images are digitally manipulated. I didn't use Photoshop. These are all uh, images that I took and that I just printed. I blew up quite large and I brought them into the space and I re-photographed them into the space. And um, I call this one knowing water because there's so much water around and there's also like on a deeper level, there's like a connectedness. No, there's a knowledge about water. Like there used to be certain waterways and there used, you know, it streams that are now kind of damped up or, or secluded or whatever. Um, but yeah, just this relationship with water and knowing about it can really help <laughs> humanity. And then also there's just, there's so many water issues. There's uh, the wetlands there are constantly being jeopardized due to oil drilling and, and building just like the other wetlands in other areas of California. So it's a constant issue. Image of photo of white shell sitting in a bed of brown shreds laying on a black linoleum floor. Text beside image, contemporary shell offerings in the theater building, CSU Long Beach 2019. Archival ink jet. I call this piece contemporary shell offerings. Um, there's a part on the campus on the west side of campus that's still kind of an open site that um, people are trying to protect. And basically, I, I took the picture of the shell offerings 
on that side of campus and then I, I printed it and then brought it into the other side of campus and, and placed it into the theater building and I, I re-photographed it. And um, it, I was kind of surprised how real it, like it looks like I didn't, it doesn't look like the photograph actually looks like there's like, it's cut into the ground. <laughs> so I was surprised about that. And the reason why I call it contemporary shell offerings, because it's not like there's other areas where there's shell middens where there's like ancient shell midden heaps and it's embedded into the ground. It's like hundreds of years old. But this one is, um, these are uh, contemporary shell offerings that were placed more recently, which shows that the space is constantly being used and it is continually being used as a ceremonial gathering space. Image of newspaper on fire with picture of man on left and headline, Indian holy village uncovered laying on light cracked ground. Text beside image, constant battles, CSU Long Beach slash Pavongna. 40 by 40 archival inkjet 2019. And this was, um, I, I found this article and basically printed it out and set it ablaze myself. <laughs> um, yeah, constant battles. I mean, there's a lot of issues. It gets very complex, which I won't dive into, but um, you can actually read some aspects of the article if you blow it up and large enough and the print that I display, you can read some of it, but it talks a little bit about the space. And, but I just think that it's ironic or that this man is getting some notoriety for uncovering something that was um, there and wasn't really meant to be uncovered and things like that. So and it talks a little bit about the space and how important to the people that live there. Image of a photo of red cloth draped over a twisted tree above green grass laying awkwardly against the dark green linoleum floor and gray wall, bottom right corner is curled back. Text beside image, thinking of future ceremonies, CSU Long Beach slash Pavongna. 40 by 40 archival inkjet 2019. Thinking of future ceremonies. So this is the area that the, the image within the image is like the area that I was mentioning on the um, west side of campus that is an active ceremonial, ceremonial site. And um, yeah, so I, just, I took this picture and brought it in. And I think there's some issues with the school um, dumping soil on the land currently and it not being removed and just, you know, disrespecting the space. Um, but the trees are beautiful. And I just was thinking, when I think of that space, it's like I wanted to be preserved forever. But the facts are that, it, you know, it may not, or it's, it's going to be a constant battle for community to have it be preserved forever. But um, so access to land is so important, as we all know. And it's, it's especially important for, let's say, Native community. And um, yeah, so thinking about the future is connected directly to land, I guess, thinking about land. Image of a photo of light colored rocks arranged in a semicircle on grass and dirt lays sandwiched between two library bookcases. Text beside image, ways of learning, CSU Long Beach slash Pavongna. 40 by 40 archival inkjet 2019. And in this image of uh, ways of learning, um, I brought another image from that area outside on the west side of campus that I took. I brought it into the library and it sort of uh, signifies like, you know, two ways of knowing or multiple, there are multiple ways of learning, of knowing things and how we gather information and, you know, are we gathering information from books, which is a great thing. And then there's also gathering information from like experience and like, you know, and learning directly from another person or through going through particular things in the being present and how sometimes the things that we learn when we're present in the firsthand experiences are the things that like stay with us like 
um, very deeply. Um, yeah, so, but also um, things of, this also represents like value systems too, because sometimes certain ways of learning and knowing may be like valued more or um, legitimized more, things like that. Image of photo of graffiti written on a rock surrounded by green grass, dirt and a tree trunk laying awkwardly against the floor in a light brick wall. Text beside image, desecration at the site of creation, CSU Long Beach slash Pavongna. Open paren inner image courtesy of Jan Sampson closed paren 40 by 40 archival link jet 2019. And this image is um, called desecration at the site of creation. And this is another image that was they took on I didn't take this image actually, the the middle image. I I got it from, I consulted with um, a, a historian that works with that space, Pavangna, and she lent me material and I looked through it and then I liked this image that she had and um, I used that one and I printed it and it's basically um, this rock has major significance and it's on, on that site. And it is the origin stories, the stories of creation basically come from that area where the rock is on Cal State Long Beach. And it's not just for like, it's for all like the Tongva, like comes from that space. And so there's a woman that lives next to that area and she comes in overseas and, and looks um, and she noticed that there was um, uh, some graffiti that I guess happens every so often to the space. So she, she documented it and I asked her if I could use the image and she said yes and I printed it and I brought it into the space and re-photographed it. Um, I think that's all I have right now. Oh yes, and- White background, text, um, resources colon. Chicano Studies Research Center HTTPS colon slash slash www.chicano.ucla.edu slash Mapping Indigenous LA HTTPS colon slash slash mila.ss.ucla.edu slash or meepsum Gloria Arianes Collection at Cal State LA Library HTTPS colon slash slash www.calstatela.edu slash special collection slash east LA dash archives Pavona Wetlands Protectors Puvia.org. I have some, a few resources I can share uh, where you know I got a lot of information that other people might if they're interested in these types of topics. And the Chicano Studies Research Center is a good one at UCLA that has a huge archive and they basically um, shared about the, they, they put up the La Raza exhibit with the Jane Autry Museum and then Mapping Indigenous LA. Um, it's another good resource for uh, indigenous history in Los Angeles and with uh, stories directly from individuals, um, Tongva individuals. And also the Gloria Ariana's collection at Cal State LA Library. It documents a lot of the Chicano movement as well from the personal collection. And the Pavangna Wetlands Protectors um, are an organization that is, you know, organizing to preserve the Magna site and the wet, surrounding wetlands. Um, I'm open for questions. I hope I made some connections. I hope I didn't go over. View of four boxes. Top left is Roman with short hair, large glasses. Top right is Isabel with long dark curly hair and glasses. Bottom right is Andrew with mustache and glasses. Bottom left is Rebecca with long blonde hair. Thank you so much, Isabel. I, I have to tell you, I really connect strongly to the work that you, I mean, all of it I think is really incredible, um, but I really connect to that last series that you did, at, that you shared with us today, that you did at Long Beach. I love how you're photographing photographs in space and, um, you know, and within architecture. And I, I, I love how it contrasts the past and the present. And like you said, sort of conflicting values of, um, ownership, land, space, ceremony, um, acquisition of knowledge. Uh, so, so thank you for that. Really, really beautiful. I also really love the uh, series that you did on um, Unipo, uh, Unipero Sarah, if I'm saying that correctly. Yeah. 
Um, and I know this is like a huge, huge issue. View of only Rebecca's box. So I, I know we only have limited time, but it certainly made me think of like uh, the canonization of so many colonizers and, you know, people who've done uh, overtly questionable and racist things throughout history. And, you know, within the last year, especially, although over time we've, we've seen a lot of um, those public sculptures topple or, um, you know, be removed uh, either, you know, forcibly or through city council meetings or whatever. I just wondered if you had any, <laughs> any thoughts to share on, you know, what we see happening with those monuments. Four box view. Yeah, um, I think it's really interesting. Well, obviously um, they're made monuments for a reason and, and they do have a power. I think every monument has a power. And um, I, I mean, if I, was, if I was a black person in the South and I would see, you know, colonial monuments, I mean, I, it would make me feel quite uh, diminished, I guess you can say. I mean, thinking about like whose histories are celebrated and things like that. So um, being on in California and seeing a lot of statues representing Hunkara Sara, and I know that from my perspective, I know that. Um, the situation is obviously very complex, but overall, um, I think there's space for other histories to be shared and told and monumentalized and and celebrated and such than these um, narrow perspectives of this history, because these are they represent um, the the lines of history that we, you know, that we've been told, the narratives, you know, the constructed narrative, really, of history that we've been told uh, growing up and that we continue to hear unless we seek out alternative historical facts. Or, I mean, <laughs> that sounds weird, <laughs> sounds bad. In, in, to, unless we we seek out uh, other history that that really happened, and a lot of it was doc well documented. So it's not like it doesn't exist. It's just not being taught. So um, I know it's it's complex. I can't say I'm missing any of those statues of Nicara Sarah that have been toppled down. I I I think it, I'm completely okay with it. I mean, we have enough memorializing of him. I mean, there's so many other things that are named after him everywhere. It's embedded everywhere. I think Stanford is removing some of his labels and some labels named after him. But um, I think even with a few statues missing, his, his presence is still very strong in California. So, um, and this idea of uh, the monument, I, I think can be re-looked at as well. Like, you know, do you really need monuments? <laughs> uh, we have a question in the chat from Peter. Peter asks, how important is beauty in your work, which is striking? Striking? Sort of oh. a comment and a question together. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you so much. View of only Isabel's box. I kind of go in and out of the idea of beauty. I know beauty is important because it's sort of like, you know, first it, it brings in the viewer, makes the viewer a pay attention to your work and interested in your work. So I know that beauty is really important. Um, I know, you know, in some contemporary art, beauty is not as important and I respect that too. It's more about like the ideas that are being represented. But ultimately I think that it's a fine balance between the ideas and, and beauty. So ultimately I would like to have both the idea of what I'm coming, what I'm trying to say and beauty work together to sort of um, bring some interest to individuals. View of only Rebecca's box. I love that you shared resources. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so in that spirit, are there any artists uh, whose work is really uh, inspiring you and that you would recommend that folks who are interested in your work check out? Four box view. Oh, um, yeah. I was thinking about that. Oh, were you want to like up and coming artists or people that I like? <laughs> 
Um, View of only Isabel's box. I really like the work of Adam Bloomberg and Oliver Chanman, and they are um, South African um, photographers. And they have been working a lot in photography, but they documented the the climate sort of like after the apartheid. And I think now they're in England and they're really looking at issues in um, Israel, the Palestinian and Israeli issues and stuff. But um, I find their perspective to be interesting. And I do, I think that, you know, they have a beauty and a message as well. So I like their work a lot, but they're pretty established. <laughs> so yeah, there's, there's others as well. View of only Andrew's box. I wonder if you could talk uh, about how you build trust in relationships with the communities that you fo- you photograph. Yeah, that's a really that's a, a really big thing for me. Um, trust. Um, View of only Isabel's box. Nothing beats personal relationships, and I think that's the most important thing. I think um, the relationships that we have are, are very important. So. Um, building relationships, um, making sure you re- respect people and what, what they want, what they desire, things like that. Work, working with people and how they want to be represented. So um, that's, that's definitely one way. View of only Rebecca's box. On that note, I love that you are shooting, uh, sorry, I shouldn't say shooting, you're documenting folks um, in the activist community and I love that you're, you're, you know, you're looking at people, I don't know, you're showing the longevity of their work. I really love that. You know, I think especially like showing the La Rasa pictures and then, you know, these folks today and the fact that they're still showing up, they're still fighting, they're still doing this work. I, I really think that's amazing. Four box um, view. So kind of taking, a, taking this another direction, but, you know, we'll have students who will view this in the future and they'll be interested in like, how can I be an artist? It's not, you know, it seems impossible. Like, how do you create a career around making art? And so I wonder if you have any advice um, that you would share to young artists who are interested in pursuing art about longevity, about creating a career. Um, that has yeah, that it's not, yeah, it's not easy. <laughs> no, it's, there's a, I think there has to be a certain fire level of interest that is going to sustain you in, in spite of uh, anything else or all obstacles and uh, in spite of like financial insecurity or whatever like there's just uh, some other things that have to uh, propel you forward and I think most of that is really um, your love for what you're doing what you what you believe in and um, the if you're working with certain issues, those issues that you want to bring forth, um, bring some attention to. View of only Andrew's box. How, how have you found um, inspiration, if you will, or motivation during the pandemic this past year um, to continue with your artworks? View of only Isabel's box. Yeah, that's been kind of tough. I think that's been tough for everybody, but especially for photographers, because you have to meet with people and a lot in the beginning or a good deal of the pandemic, people didn't want to meet up and are you, you know, are you vaccinated? I didn't get vaccinated so very recently, which I was kind of didn't know if I wanted to do. And so those issues are always coming up. So I kind of looked more inward and I was doing other things. I, I think I started learning music with friends a bit and um, looking through maybe stuff that I've already have and I'm reconfiguring my life. Um, but ultimately I think all these things sort of add to, you know, who we are, add to you as an artist, like all of life informs your practice, you know, informs who you are, your perspective, things like that. So all these experiences um, are sort of, you know, you can use them on some level. But yes, it was quite tough. It wasn't my most productive time. <laughs> Four box view. Well, I want to be conscious of your time, Isabel, and our attendees. I want to thank you so much for spending some time with us and sharing uh, more about your practice. It was really a joy to to hear from you today. Um, And I want to thank those of you who attended live today. We appreciate it. House logo Um, with enclosed text in top left corner. Text, Wignall Museum of Contemporary Art. 
Access our schedule of programs and recordings www.chafu.edu slash Wignall. Please visit us online and uh, to learn more about future programs, uh, Roman just put our address in the chat. Text, we ask that you complete a quick online survey that will help us as we evaluate our online programming and plan our future programs. HTTPS colon slash slash tiny URL dot com slash Wignall Spring 21 Visitor Survey. He'll also follow up with a very brief... Um, request again to complete a survey. We'd really appreciate a couple minutes of your time. It'll help us in planning for the future. So thanks again, Isabel, and thank you all. Please take good care and we'll see you in the fall. Okay, thank you. They all wave to camera. White background, text Chafee College with logo of two hills in middle. Wignall Museum of Contemporary Art Home Edition. An image of a house encloses text. Image fades to white.